Hey everybody, to start off this video, this one's gonna be a little bit different. So to start, my daily driver, the only car I have right now, is a 2021 Jeep Grand Cherokee L, and it is the Summit Reserve model, which is the, the highest trim. There's the Summit, and then the Reserve, which adds things such as the Macintosh sound system, it has the suede headliner, it's a two-tone, so it's silver, and the roof is black, uh, different wheels, and a couple other little things. The leather on the doors goes all the way down versus with the, the normal Summit, the door pockets are still like a plastic. But I figured I would take some time to not only show you guys what I do drive right now, but also go over a couple likes and dislikes of the car since I've had it since October 30th of 2021. So as I mentioned, this is a 2021 Jeep Grand Cherokee L. The L is long wheelbase. This does have a third row of seats and they do have it in two different setups. They have it in the 222 configuration where the middle row right behind me has a captain's chair setup with a center console in the middle. And then the back seats is just another two seats. They also have it in a 232 configuration where the middle row is just a bench seat with three seats. But in the Summit Reserve model, uh, at least I believe so, they only make them in the, the 222 configuration. So you can only get the captain's chairs in the back seats. So here is the, the dash of the car. Obviously you can change a bunch of the different settings. Typically I keep it here on the fuel mileage tab. Also, when I'm driving at night, sometimes I'll flip it up and it does have a night vision camera. It just takes a little load. There we go. So it does have night vision. And this car does have, I believe, every option that was available besides the rear seat entertainment. So onto a couple things that I like about this car. First off, it's, it's a super comfortable car. Uh, taking a look at the seats, they look really nice. I love the, the pleated leather look. It has good lumbar because you know I've had back surgery and I need that. The massage is okay. I thought it was really cool at first, but it really doesn't do much. In fact, when I turn it on, most of the time I completely forget it's on and then it turns itself off after 20 minutes. The seats are comfortable. They were a little stiff at first. They took a little bit to break in, but overall, I think the seats are really good. Next up is the audio system. So this car being the Summit Reserve was optioned with the Macintosh sound system. And I'll say it is, it's phenomenal. It's got sharp highs and mids and the bass is awesome. I did run into one issue where the subwoofer, I guess it rattled a bolt loose, one of the, the bolts that holds it to the car and it started to rattle, but took it to the dealership and they had it fixed that day. I, I can't complain about the sound system. It is probably, I, I'd say it's one of the best sound systems I have had in a car. The next thing, which may also be a dislike, is the air suspension. It's super soft in normal mode. It's sportier in aero mode, and obviously it has entry exit and then two upper off-road modes. What I have noticed is I drive it more in aero mode because I feel like regular mode is too soft and it kind of feels like a huge car. And in the off-road modes, I have used it a couple times and I noticed the suspension's really clunky. I like the way it rides on the highway and I do appreciate the soft suspension, but I think it's a little floaty and it makes the car seem a lot bigger than it really is. So it's a like and a dislike. So the final thing on my list of likes for this car is I guess the overall appearance, the exterior appearance. Uh, this car looks like a more expensive vehicle. In fact, a lot of people that uh, maybe aren't car people tend to mistake my car for my brother-in-law's Range Rover Velar because they're the same color, silver with black roof. So if we leave one at the house and take the other one, we always get calls asking where we are because it looks like your car is here when it's not. So as I mentioned, I really like the two-tone paint. That was a selling point for me. I didn't want a monotone car. I really liked how this car was silver with the black roof. I think it just looked a lot better. And it contrasts well with the interior being this saddle color. So the looks punch above their price class. This was a you know, $65,000 car, and now they've actually bumped the MSRP up. So to build this exact car, you're actually looking at, I believe, 70, somewhere in the 75, north of 75 range. Not a cheap car by any means, but I think the looks kind of compare to some of the you know higher-end cars 
Not saying that the quality is there, because it's definitely not, but the looks are comparable. But now, for a couple of my dislikes. There is a list. My first one, which was kind of a, a big thing for me, is seat position. Especially with the driver's seat, I don't feel like it goes low enough. So I'm 6'2", and if I touch the ceiling, I'm actually touching my hair. So I only have about, you know, a finger's width, let's say half an inch, between my head and the ceiling. And I know I need a haircut when my hair starts touching the ceiling. What that also does is the heads up display. Because of the seating position, this car definitely doesn't seem like it was made for people over, let's say, six foot two, six foot three, because the seat can't go low enough. And with the seat not going low enough, I tend to cut off the top of the heads up display. I can't see the whole thing. That is kind of annoying. And that is a, that is a big dislike. I think the seat should go lower. This is a you know, 6,000 pound three row SUV. Don't assume someone that's 5'4 is going to be driving it. My next dislike, which I really didn't think about until after I purchased it and maybe the first time we decided we wanted to take it on a long trip, and that is usability. The rear seats are not absolutely comfortable. Obviously, people have dealt with it. We've gone on two and three hour road trips and no one really has any complaints, but for long, long distance, I definitely wouldn't want to sit back there. Another thing relating to usability is the power. I opted or didn't really have a choice. They didn't have a whole lot of the 5.7 liters out when I purchased this. So I ended up with the 3.6 liter Pentastar with an eight speed transmission. So I think the issue with that is the car is already 6,000 pounds. It's a big car. I can't imagine towing with this car. I've had 5.7 you know, liter Hemi V8s in my uh, 2019 Ram. I cannot imagine towing anything bigger than maybe a jet ski. I just, I think it's grossly underpowered as it is. I, I don't think towing would go well. Another thing that I didn't really take into consideration until after I purchased it and we were going on that first road trip was space. So you would think, well, it's got all the space you need. But one thing I didn't consider is luggage space. This car has six seats. And if I put six people in these seats, or we'll just say five, so one in the back, because that gives you enough room, because the back is pretty small anyway. But when you do that, there's no room in the trunk for luggage. Uh, there's actually been a couple times where I have taken my family to the airport and I can only take me and three people because with the size of the average checked in luggage, there's not enough room for six people with all their luggage. I think usability from a storage or you know a space for luggage, it doesn't have ample space. You've got six seats, you can take six people, but you can't take six people and a week's worth of luggage for each person. You're basically limited to four people and their luggage. So in all reality, this is pretty much just a normal Grand Cherokee, but you're missing a seat. As I mentioned before, with the whole towing aspect, this car is very slow. I'm sure you can imagine being a 200 and something horsepower engine in a 6,000 pound car I think there were better engines they could have stuck in this car. I actually took this in for service and they gave me a Ram 1500 that had the e-torque V6 and I absolutely wish they would have put that motor in this car. I think it would have performed so much better because the torque was there, the economy was there. You would think a V6 gets decent economy, but I actually average fuel mileage wise what I do in a Ram 1500 with a 5.7. So you're really not looking any better economy wise in this car. With it being slow, the transmission's also kind of odd. Um, it's not really quick to downshift when slowly accelerating. A lot of times when I'm going uphill, it doesn't know what gear it wants to be in. So the transmissions definitely could use a little bit of work. That being said, I actually had an issue with this transmission that had to be fixed around 10,000 miles. I noticed that going from first to second gear, the transmission would shudder. And as time went on until I got to, it was probably about 14,000 miles when the work was done, it got worse and worse until it was just alarming how bad the shutter was from first to second gear. And it actually went from first to second and then started going second to third. And that's when I decided to take it in. And it ended up being the valve body in the transmission that had to be replaced. So at 14,000 miles, this car needed minor transmission work, but the valve body had basically gone bad and needed to be replaced. 
this car being as slow as it is and me coming from having higher performance cars in the past, another dislike with this car is the lack of passing power. There is not a chance that I could pass someone if I needed to. In fact, I've tried and you're, you're in the gas for a long time before you can get enough speed to pass someone on the highway. You're better off just staying behind them. The last thing that I guess is a dislike, and I had mentioned the quality of the car isn't really there. It looks great. The looks on the inside definitely punch above their weight class. However, fit and finish on the inside isn't the greatest. There's panels that don't align, stuff that squeaks. There's been several times where I've had to take the car back because something's rattling. Uh, first it was the subwoofer, then it was something in the ceiling where the fam cam is up behind me here. So there, there have been plenty of fit and finish things with this car that I just really wasn't happy with. Wearing darker pants, they rub off on the seats. So wearing jeans, you constantly have to clean these seats. It's, it's kind of a pain having to scrub these seats every couple of weeks to keep them looking good. If not, they start to get really dark and you can see them turning a different color. And yeah, you really can't get after them for that because I'm sure there's plenty of cars that have the same issue, but I, I definitely, for, for the price that I paid for this car, I definitely would have expected it to be a better put together car. Yeah, you know, when you're looking to spend $70,000 on a car and you're looking between a brand new Jeep Grand Cherokee L or possibly a Range Rover, it might be better to go with the Range Rover. And I know they say reliability in a Range Rover is bad, but honestly, the new ones are not bad at all. We have had no mechanical issues. So take that into consideration. This car looks really good, but if you're expecting to get foreign car quality from Jeep, you're probably gonna be disappointed. The final dislike and something that I am still dealing with to this day is the sunroof. With that said, I will never buy another American-made car with a panoramic sunroof or car in general with a panoramic sunroof. About 10,000 miles into owning this car, I really hadn't paid too much attention to it, but when I took the car in to get the valve body replaced, my friend in the dealership found water in the trunk. Turns out that the sunroof was leaking and the drains were insufficient for the amount of water that was getting into them. And due to that, water would leak out of the sunroof drains into the, the C pillar, the pillar all the way at the back of the car, and the water would drip out of the pillar through the subwoofer grate and soak the floor. Water is coming out from here, going down into the subwoofer. It's actually splashing off of here, getting the mat all wet. Not as bad on this side today, I guess. Although there is some water dripping down. But yeah, this side seems to be pretty bad. And this is what they haven't been able to fix. And the issue is it's, I mean, my hands soaking wet. Keep in mind, this is the second FCA vehicle that I have owned that has had leak issues. And unfortunately, this is the second FCA car where it was taken to the dealership three to four times for repairs, and each time the car still leaked afterwards. Don't get me wrong, I love the car overall. I think it drives all right, but there's definitely some issues. Maybe it's just my luck with buying first year run vehicles, but the car has issues. And when looking to purchase a $65,000, $75,000 car, I'm sure anyone would appreciate somebody's opinion, past experiences, just to see whether they really want to go down that road or possibly choose another brand. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hopefully somebody may find it useful. Maybe someone that's looking for a car like this. If you guys have any questions, please drop them below in the comments. Talk to you guys soon.